I've been reading the things, and I'm going to share with you these uh, Pong Kumas interactions with him, Gabi Ochi, Dako, and Kukubak, when I think there's something I have to say about Professor Frimpong Boati. He's a heart surgeon, a particularly good one. If there are five in the world, he may be one of them. But you see, he thinks that because he's a heart surgeon, when he comes out of the theater to work, everybody else is a nurse. That's what he thinks. I think that's what he thinks. He's a very intelligent man. But please tell him that he's not the only intelligent person. He's not the only. And when he comes out of the heart surgeon, we outside in politics, we are not nurses. We are not uh, medical associates. We are not, uh, uh, what do they call it, the middle between doctors and nurses, what do they call it? Physician assistant. We are not physician assistant. So when he comes, he's coming to discuss with us a narrative, and we will have a view. He's a very intelligent man, but he's not the only intelligent man. I mean, he should know that by now. He's, this he came. He went to Kolibu as chief executive. It didn't quite work. He did uh, cardiothoracic. Excellent. And uh, I saw on social media uh, people talking about his relationship with Rawlings. Rawlings really backed him. And, and that's one of the good points of Fly Lieutenant Rawlings for supporting Professor Frimpong Boati to set up that thing. That was a very good one. In fact, if there is any positive about Fly Lieutenant Rawlings that was not public, it's about Frimpong Boati because he didn't know him. And when he saw Frimpong Boati and saw what Frimpong Boati wants to do, he went to Kolibu himself to ensure that those undermining Frimpong Boati are cut off and that the cardiothoracic center will be set up. And it was set up, so that's good. But Frimpong Boati should by now understand that. He's not the only intelligent, cardiothoracic surgeons are intelligent. Yes, they are. Police officers too are intelligent. DCOPs, they are very intelligent. Military people are intelligent. Bankers are intelligent. Lawyers are intelligent. Judges are intelligent. Some journalists may be intelligent. Some footballers are intelligent. So, as like we are building a country, we need everybody. It's not just about him and his view and what he wants to do. And, and because you think you don't agree with him, you are corrupt. Where is that coming from? That seems to be the problem he has. So those of you who know anthropology and sociology, please get close to him and explain to him that whilst he's a very intelligent person, he's not the only intelligent person in the system. And when he says certain things, he must evidence them. He shouldn't just talk and leave it. And say that when I came, you were four years old. I'm going to deal with that tonight, though. But that, that, was, that was very disappointing for me. Okay, they got his picture alone. So, Prof, good evening. Thank you very much for watching, if you are. Uh, we think that you are a great cardiothoracic surgeon. But some of the things you've published, we will in, in, interrogate them. And we will respectfully disagree with you, Prof. Because you are not the only intelligent person, you see. You are not the only intelligent person. You are, and Ghana needs you. We all need you. Uh, during the crisis of the, of the Galamsi, I went to Professor Fimpon Boatin's house. He will tell you. He, for example, he doesn't speak any lie. He will tell you. It was a Sunday. I went to his home. Now, I had gone to his home because some people had called me. And, and you see, because I have been against the winner-takes-all principle under the Constitution, I'm always eager to support people who think that the winner-takes-all has affected them negatively. So I'm always eager to do that. So some NDC businessman called me and said, listen, Paul, Ministry of Air Science and Environment, I've done work for them. They didn't pay me. My own people didn't pay me and they lost the election. Now, Professor Fimpon Boat says that he doesn't want to pay me. And I said, oh, I'm sorry about that, Alaji. But I'll go and talk to him. He said, no, Paul, this is not right. We can't build a country. I've done the work. At the time, I'm an NDC person, so they won't pay me. I said, Alaji, I'm sorry. I went to Professor Fimpon at his house. And I said, Prof, Alaji says you owe him. We do this thing is not correct. You know, he's an NDC person, but he's done the work. We have to pay him. And then Prof told me that there are difficulties with the, the documentation. And he showed it to me. He was very kind. He, he showed me everything. Difficulty with the documentary. Once he settles it, he will be able to pay them. Now, then I brought up Galamsey. In his house, I spoke to him about it. I spoke to him about it. He admitted that his son Jojo has a, a, a concession. He told me that Jojo has a concession. But that Jojo has had a concession since 2008. And I told him nicely, that Prof, but it, is it not, uh, does it not, uh, uh, does it not, is it not curious that? Jojo got his concession in 2008, and he's only able to implement the concession when you have become, your, you, his father, have become Minister of uh, Environment. And he said, no, but Jojo does clean mining. I said, I agree with that. I, I can believe that Jojo does clean mining. But it's a bit curious, bro, that he got a concession in 2008, never used it, and began to use it only when you have become Minister of Environment. I asked him that question. So that's my encounter with him. I, I did that. Bro, if you remember, I came to your house, and we had that Sunday, we had that conversation. He told me that rice and egg stew is very good. Uh, it's healthy. I remember he told me that as well. And then he told me about how he does church in his house every Sunday. He doesn't go to church. And we, we talked about all of that. So yes, I understand his passion against Galamsey. I understand it. 
But he also must understand that when he says something and somebody rebats, he has to look at the document and provide evidence and stop the beating about the bush that you're a small boy and uh, somebody in your village says you are doing galams, all those kinds of things, not necessary. Okay, now let's get to the story. Uh, let's bring back the upon chroma. Let's get, let's get to the story and do the upon chroma one. It's uh, 13 past 12. We'll finish very soon. Okay, are we, uh, is it going to come? Yeah, it's going to come. Okay, great. All right. So we are going to start with what Professor Fimbom Boatin said. We've summarized it, and it's as follows. One, firstly, Professor Fimbom Boatin claims that an unnamed person called him to inform him that Mr. Opon Kroma had held a meeting of MPP and NDC journalists on February 8, 2020 in Dodoa to discuss a strategy to bring him down. He suggests that this is the cause of subsequent negative media reports about him. That's what he says. Okay. Secondly, he claims that on the 13th of February, 2020, Kojo Opon Kroma uh, started his brief to the cabinet with a report on Frimpon Boateng and missing excavators. He creates an impression that this brief is to cabinet was a deliberate and sinister act targeted at him. I, I mean, I'm going to deal with this later, but I don't understand this. You, if something is targeted at you, you will not be sitting there when it is said. And if you are in the, respectfully, Prof, what you are saying, I, I'm not sure. You are sitting down in the cabinet. Information minister gives a briefing to the cabinet. Right away, the president will switch to you, Professor Frimpon Boateng, what do you have to say about it? So why is that, why is that bad? If it's said behind you, if he comes and you are not there, he goes to somebody, you are sitting in the cabinet, you are there. And then they say, information minister, give you a briefing. And I understand that information minister gives a briefing to cabinet at every cabinet meeting about what is happening in the country in terms of media. He does that, that is his work. He does all the time. So he stands up at cabinet meeting, information minister brief, he says, Frimpon Boateng and the missing excavators, it's a story we need to look at. And then he goes through the rest of the story. Then you sit in cabinet and say that he's against you. But you are there, so you can raise your hand. Mr. President, what he said is not true. But that's, after all, it's a battle of ideas. That's what it's about. Why does he feel that Frimpo Boy, upon Kuma saying something about him when in his presence is a problem? I don't even get it. But anyway, let's move on. Thirdly, he claims that on media appearances after 2020 election, Mr. Oponkroma had mentioned that the effect of the fight against illegal mining contributed to the MPP's performance. Again, he creates the impression that this was a sinister attempt to blame him for the fortunes of the MPP in some mining communities. I'm not sure whether Oponkroma was blaming him, but the point Oponkroma stated, according to us, is a fact. Ah, yes, mining communities did not vote for MPP. MPP lost parliamentary seats in mining communities. Is that not a fact? Mirku Duka, a deputy minister of lands, a very popular MP, almost lost. Like they won by the skin of the teeth. And he's extremely popular in the place. He lost a tiny, wee bit tiny skin of the hair. That's how he won it. So it is true that MPP's fortunes was affected by illegal mining. How is that against him? You see, please, you people reach him, eh? Uh, sociology, go to him. And he's a nice guy. Go to him. Explain to him that it's not against him. He's a heart surgeon. He's a very good heart surgeon. But it's not against him. He should understand that it's not against him. All right. <laughs>